<laughs> now you wouldn't give me Louise. No, there's no way. No, not at all. Oh, oh hello. Oh, aren't you adorable? Oh my gosh. Hello. They oh they are a godsend during all this, aren't they? Just oh, they are. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey Lynn. They're, they're not yeah. used to having us all around so much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Lynn, they're going to see Becky tomorrow to get groomed. Oh, good. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I bet she wants to get her hands on them. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, a, with a shaver. <laughs> <laughs> Louise is growing out already, but we'll, we'll, we're okay with it. I'm with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is as big as he's going to get. Oh. How old is he, Rosemary? He's going on eight months. What is he? Oh, he's so cute. What a cuddle bunny, huh? Oh, my God. What? Well, uh, well, he has some chihuahua and and some terrier and some of this and some of that. That's oh, kind of dog. <laughs> he's precious. He is. Father? Yes. Father? This morning, we really need to keep Ryan Austin in our prayers. He's having a very tough time in a very serious situation. Okay. It's very good. Yeah, we prayed for him at morning prayer, and he's been on our list because I know he's been real up and down. So. Well, it's it's down at this point, and it's it's got everybody extremely concerned. Who did you say? Is, who is it? Ryan Austin, Linda Hoff's nephew. Ryan. Oh no. Is it Brian or is it Ryan? No, it's Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. Oh, well, God knows. Yeah. He's a 35-year-old or a 33? 30. 30. Or... 30. Mm. I knew she. he went in for surgery, but that's it. Yeah. No, he's had some complications that are now getting extremely serious. Mm. Oh, no. Is it from cancer? No, it was benign. It was, it, it's a issue yeah. where a tube put in the bowel, now the bowel is leaking in the abdomen and it's coming, oh, it's just, it's a mess. It's a real mess. I'm so sorry. I'll pray for him. Please. Yeah, we'll definitely include him. Yeah. 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 Yes. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Um, well, we're at 10.05, so let's go ahead and get started, and um, folks can join us as they um, see fit. And I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody just to watch the okay. background noise. Of course, you all have permission to turn yourselves on when the time comes to read or whatever. So um, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day and for your presence here with us. You tell us that where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there, even over the internet wires and the miles. We appreciate your presence here with us, that you might uh, guide our discussion and let us hear your word in new and exciting ways and explore your gospels, that they might touch our hearts in new ways. Gracious God, we have many in our community that are hurting, but we lift up especially to you today, Ryan Alston and Carol Barnett, who are going through particularly tough times um, real touch and go kind of times, and we just ask the healing power of your Holy Spirit to be with them. We ask for your loving embrace and presence to be felt by them, that they know that you are there. Gracious God, take away any fear and anxiety that they might have, and just let them know your peace. Let them be still and feel your presence with them, and let the healing power of your Holy Spirit be at work with them even before at this time. And gracious God, we just lift them up to you as well of all of those on our prayer list that need your, your guidance, your intrusion in their, their situations. And gracious God, we just ask you to be with them all and lift them up to you in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So um, we're going to kind of finish 27 and then move on to 28. And uh, we'll read some of these, but I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time dragging on about the crucifixion. Um, I think that's kind of a ghastly, gory thing, and I don't know that we really need to uh, 
center on that as uh, Matthew did. I think Matthew particularly did because um, the people in his community were still being persecuted as well. And so he was trying to relate the, to them what Jesus had gone through, uh, just kind of a, as a reference for them of the suffering that they might face. Um, but I think we left off, I believe, on uh, verse 32 last week. Is that correct? 2732. Can I get someone to read 32 through 44 for me? Verses 32 through 44 on chapter 27. Melinda, go ahead and unmute yourself. And As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right, and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. Very good. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to read just this one in, in our little books that we have. They have one neat little pair, not neat, I mean, I guess, but... um. One paragraph that did a good job of kind of describing, I guess, uh, what crucifixion was in the time of the Romans. And I just wanted to read that real quick because uh, that really stood out to me for us to understand what Jesus went through. Um, it says, crucifixion may not be the most torturous way to die, but it is undeniably horrible. In fact, the Romans protected themselves from crucifixion, banning its use against their own citizens except in cases of treason or desertion. And many believed it was better to commit suicide than to allow oneself to be crucified. The Romans crucified mostly enemies of Rome, traitors, violent criminals, and slaves, and they did so often. Part of the horror of crucifixion was the freedom that executioners had to compound the punishment's customary cruelty. So in other words, depending on the whims of the person doing the execution, they could make it easier or heavier, depending on how they felt by the person being crucified. And as we heard in the last paragraph that Melinda just read for us, um, everybody was taunting Jesus at this time. This man who had done nothing and was declared as uh, Hosanna in the highest and thrown uh, branches just the Sunday before on Palm Sunday, now the entire crowds, the Romans, the high priest, even the Jewish citizens, even the bandits hanging next to him are all kind of taunting Jesus saying, you know, who are you when just a week earlier they were saying exactly who he was? Uh, you know, Hosanna, the son of God. So how quickly we see the mob mentality turn, how quickly we see, um, you know, we see people change in their opinion of, of who Jesus is. And as we've said before, Matthew was very concerned with tying Jesus into the Old Testament as a fulfillment of the prophecies of the Old Testament. And as you read, if you look at this reading that Melinda just left, that just read, there's a ton of stuff in here that goes back to Old Testament Psalms and the Old Testament prophecies when they talk about offering him wine mixed with gall. And then they say that they divided his clothes by casting lots. Um, and then we read, uh, you know, um, the people taunting him saying you would destroy the temple, things like that. 
All of those allude back to a lot of what Isaiah said in Isaiah's prophecy, and also the Psalms. You know, we read uh, Psalm uh, 22 uh, during Holy Week on Monday, Thursday, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And a lot of this imagery is in there about, you know, um, being fed wine mixed with gall and things like that. So um, Matthew is definitely on, on the cross tying Jesus into um, the Old Testament, that he is a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy for the Messiah, even though he's being taunted. Now, as we see the people taunting, Matthew really kind of gives them a shot right between the eyes in the way that he describes them. And that's not by accident. Remember last week we talked about the fact that um, there would have been tension between the Jewish people because there were the believers of Jesus in the synagogue and the people who didn't believe in Jesus in the synagogue. And so there was a lot of tension between those people and the ones that had the authority were the ones that did not believe in Jesus. They were the ones that believed that maybe Jesus was a prophet, maybe he was just a teacher, but they didn't believe that he was truly the Messiah. So Matthew's kind of kind of brushing back against them a little bit in his gospel here by the way that he portrays the Jewish people and especially the high priest and how they um, and how they're reacting to um, to Jesus. Um, I think I'm going to pass for just a moment on the death of Jesus because we've just done that in Holy Week, and so I think that's still kind of kind of kind of fresh in our minds. And there's some things after this I want to make sure we get to. Um, I'll come back and see if anybody has any questions about that from what they read. But uh, for the sake of kind of moving forward, because we do have a little bit that we want to get uh, uh, take care of today, I'm going to move on to verse 57 and uh, ask somebody if they would for me to read verses 57 through 66, chapter 27. 57 through 66. Nancy, if you'll unmute yourself and then you can go ahead and read those verses for us, please. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus's body and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own tomb, own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the God. Okay. So we have Joseph of Arimathea uh, coming in here who was a rich man and also was probably one of the religious um, leaders, uh, kind of like Nicodemus who also turned and became a disciple of Jesus. So we see that kind of toward the end of the, at the end of our scenario here, there were people uh, in the Jewish higher echelon that turned to and believed in uh, Jesus Christ. Hold on one second. Uh, Rosemary's trying to get back in. And so, um, and so this Joseph of Arimathea, who has now become a follower of Jesus, wants to make sure that he has a proper burial and really nothing more. Um, most of you probably know by the, um, by the Jewish faith that according to their faith, when someone dies, they're supposed to be uh, buried within 24 hours. There's not supposed to be a long waiting period. Um, in fact, before the sun goes down on the next day, they're supposed to be buried. Um, and, and so that's why Joseph goes and asks for the body so that he can give it a proper Jewish burial as Jesus was a Jewish citizen, um, even though he had been crucified. And so uh, they give Joseph the, the right to do that. And then we get for the first time ever, a conspiracy theory. 
the Jewish leaders come to Rome and say, what if they steal his body? What if they move the stone, <laughs> steal his body, and then go tell everybody that he's not there because he rose and he did what he said he was going to do and, and, and was brought up, you know, and, and rose again. And then they'll all believe that this was really Jesus and they'll believe the things that he taught them and the things that he said about us in you know, quotes. And so uh, the religious leaders are very worried about what happens if he does rise again. So he has gotten into their heads so much that they actually believe what he's saying. They're so worried about that coming true. Now, if they didn't believe that at all, why would they worry about it? They wouldn't. And certainly all of his followers have run away. They ran away at the sign of the crucifixion. They haven't even been in the story uh, since Peter in the courtyard when, when the servant girl said, you're one of them, and he denied Jesus. Other than in John's gospel, we see John at the cross with, with Mary, the mother of God, and and Mary Magdalene, but in Matthew's story, there's not been a single, uh, you know, disciple around from this whole scenario until Jesus' death, and so um, you wonder where they would have had the strength and courage to go and steal Jesus's body out of the tomb, or if they even knew where Jesus would have been buried. They were gone, so how would they know where he was? But still, Pilate, trying to appease the, uh, the higher-ups in the religious order, says, well, you have soldiers, Take a guard with you, although apparently it was a Roman guard, we'll find out in the next verse as well. But take a guard with you and go guard the tomb and make sure that nobody comes and steals the body. And so then we have now the tail end, the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ from the tomb. But we have all this activity going on even after Jesus' death. We have people that are so worried about him and his message that they want to make sure that it doesn't get out. So we're going to move on to chapter 28, and we have a couple of little revor uh, verses here. Uh, can I get someone to read in chapter 28 of Matthew, uh, verses number 1 through 10, the resurrection of Jesus, verses 1 through 10? Somebody want to take that for me that hadn't read? Cheryl, can you take that for me? Just unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a little puzzler here at the end of this verse, and I'm going to see if you guys can figure out what that puzzler is. But so we have um, after the Sabbath day, so this is, um, you know, of course, the Sabbath is Saturday, so this is Sunday morning, which is why we celebrate on Sunday. That's our day, the Lord's Day. Um, at the, the first day of the week was dawning. Uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. So the two that are most concerned about Jesus at this time are not the 12, not any of the guys, but of course, the women, <laughs> who have actually been the most faithful servants of Jesus Christ, as we follow, you know, these gospels and block like this. It was always Mary Magdalene and Mary, his mother, and some of the other women that were always there for him in the most crisis times. Um, the guys were actually pretty unreliable. 
But they went to see the tomb, and then suddenly there's this great earthquake, and it says the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And, and um, when they say angel in Matthew, they mean a messenger of the Lord. So it didn't necessarily have to be an angel that we think. It could be like the three guys that came to Abraham, you know, if you remember, and talked to him, just a messenger of the Lord. And um, the earthquake is important because we almost always have some kind of a theophany, some kind of a big event that goes on before God actually sends his messenger in. Um, you know, we have some kind of big happening going on to kind of wake people up and let them know that it's God. You know, this particularly happened with Moses on the mountain and stuff. Remember that uh, there was always big, big movement going on. And at the transfiguration, um, there, were, there was the big sound and stuff like that. And same with Pentecost. So um, we always have these kind of things to, to kind of describe the coming of God. But um, he, the angel, rolled the, the, the stone back and sat on it, it says. And he was, appeared like lightning, just da dazzling white, clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook and became like dead men. They fell to the ground and pretended to be dead because they were so scared of the angel. But the angel says to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. He's raised just like he told you he would be. And he tells them to go quickly and tell the other disciples that he's been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. So they left the tomb quickly with great fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. But they met Jesus on the way, and he says to him, Greetings. And they came and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. So this is Jesus really, in this gospel, his first appearance to other disciples. Remember in some of the other ones, they go to the tomb and the tomb is empty, but they don't really see Jesus yet. They go back to the other disciples and talk about that the tomb is empty, but they have not actually seen Jesus. So of course, the first person that Jesus makes himself known to, not one of his 12 disciples, but Mary Magdalene. <laughs> Okay, one of the most faithful of the disciples. So it doesn't matter who or how we think we are being called. What matters is our faithfulness to Jesus Christ. That's what's gonna. That's what's gonna tell out in the end. Because you know we can call ourselves priests and followers and whatever all we want to, but it's how we actually live our life. It's how we actually show our faith to Jesus Christ that in the end is going to show our faithfulness to Him. Now, for my question to you, the little puzzler here, do you guys notice the puzzler? Where does Jesus tell Mary and the disciples to meet him? Galilee, right? Head scratcher. Do we ever read anywhere in the Gospels of Jesus being in Galilee again? No, in fact, when he comes to speak to the disciples, where are they? They're still in the upper room from Monday, Thursday in Jerusalem. <laughs> he doesn't meet them in Galilee. He meets them in the upper room, or he meets them by the side of the beach there in Jerusalem, right? When he has his final thing with uh, Peter, and he's carried away in the ascension before he goes to Galilee. So nowhere in any of the things that we know about Jesus other than Matthew's gospel, is there any indication that he returned to Galilee? Now, we also have to wonder if he means just the Sea of Galilee or if he means the city of Galilee. Um, the Sea of Galilee could be because it ringed around where Jerusalem was. And actually, that was the sea, the beach on which the disciples saw Jesus cooking the fish and came for kind of their last little lesson with him. So maybe that's what Matthew is talking about is the Sea of Galilee. But that really is kind of a head scratcher for us because it doesn't line up with anything that we know from Luke or from John, the other more expansive gospels about the resurrection. And in fact, Matthew never goes there in his gospel. Matthew never talks about going to Galilee and seeing Jesus in Galilee. We have just this, this expression from him um, uh, in this particular pericope. Okay, and so now that the, 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 the girl, the women have left, Mary and Mary have left to go tell the other disciples 
So, you know, I, I could I, I can just see the guards sitting there laying there with their eyes closed and they kind of peek when I open to see if anybody's looking, you know, like you used to do, like with your brothers and sisters to see if you were in trouble, you know, is mom looking at them or is she looking at me? And so the guards are kind of looking around with one eye, okay, is he gone? Is the angel gone? Can we get up? And in fact, they do. And so they get up and they go back um, to report on, to the chief priest on what's happened here. And so we have the report of the guard on verses 11 through 15. Who would like to read that for me? Short fort verses 11 through 15. Can I get a hand? Someone who hasn't read yet. Uh, Diane, would you take that? And then Rosemary, I'll let you catch the last verses, okay? So Diane, just unmute yourself. Uh, hold on, let me unmute you here real quick. I'll unmute you. Okay. okay. Go ahead. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, you must say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And the story is still told among the Jews to this day. Okay. Um, thank you. Keep going. No, no, that's it. Just stop there for a minute. We're going to talk about this real quick. So, um, so the conspiracy theory uh, continues. Um, the very thing they worried about, they're now putting in place and telling the lie, even though it didn't happen, that the disciples came and stole Jesus just so people would not believe that he actually rose, that they actually stole the body. So this is the chief priest because of the erosion of their power pushing back against this miracle because they know if people really know that Jesus rose from the dead, that he would indeed be called the Messiah and they would lose their power over him. And once again, did you notice the parallel here to Judas? What do the chief priests pull out? Bags of money, okay? Anytime we want something to happen, we can always pay somebody off and make it happen, you know? We can always do a criminal enterprise and throw a bag of money and they'll do the things that we need to do. And so um, we have an interesting verse here and that says, if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Anybody want to guess what happened to guard if they were found being asleep when they were supposed to be guarding something? And it got to the governor's ears that his two guards fell asleep and stole the body of Jesus, the very thing he sent them to, life would not be good for them. Life would be very bad for them. And in fact, I believe we hear otherwise that these two, uh, these two uh, guards actually fled uh, Jerusalem after this when they had their money because they were so worried about what might happen uh, with uh, Pontius Pilate, with the governor there. So, um, so just wow, you know, we're worried about them stealing the body. And so now we're going to make it seem like they stole the body. Why didn't they just let it go and let, you know? <laughs> but once again, they didn't believe he was actually going to be raised. They didn't believe he was going to be raised. And now that it's come true, they're having to kind of put their plan B into effect and say that, well, this all happened because Jesus was right, you know, <laughs> was raised. So it's really funny. So, um, we're going to finish off, and the last thing that Matthew does is kind of the closing chapter of his gospel as he commissions the disciples. This is Jesus' last word with the disciples, and it's uh, verses 16 through 20. So, Rosemary, would you take that for me, please? And this will conclude, actually, the book of Matthew for us. So, um, Rosemary, if you would read uh, verses 16 through 20 on chapter uh, 28, I believe it is. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Okay. 
So we have uh, the ending of this, and it says, uh, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them, um, and perhaps, once again, they're meaning a mountain by the, the shore of Galilee. That's what he said when I said, I'll see you in Galilee. Um, we do know in Luke as well, before the ascension, that Jesus talked to the disciples on the mountain outside of Jerusalem. Um, and so, you know, he directed them, and he, he, you know, some of them worshipped him. It said, some doubted in here. Now, remember, Matthew doesn't write about doubting Thomas or Jesus showing his hands inside or any of that kind of stuff. They just go to the mountain and Jesus is there. So they've not had any of that interaction that we have from Luke. Um, and it's a real interesting translation. Uh, doubted isn't the original word that we use here in the original Greek. The original word is when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some hesitated. It doesn't really say that they doubted, just that they were maybe uneasy. Um, and of course, remember in Matthew, this is the first time they're seeing Jesus after the resurrection. Um, might we all hesitate if we saw somebody living that we thought was dead <laughs> and who had been buried in a tomb? Um, we might hesitate as well, even though he told them he was coming back. Uh, that had to be something for them. Now, of course, it wasn't completely unusual because right before he went to Jerusalem, Jesus did what? He raised Lazarus from the dead. So they have seen someone who had died and been entombed for three days resurrected. They knew that Jesus had that power. So they might not have doubted so much as I kind of like the word hesitated because I think maybe we all sometimes hesitate uh, we don't necessarily doubt Jesus. We have faith in Jesus, but we still hesitate taking our step toward ministry, uh, the ministry that he calls us to, even though we have faith in him. So, um, but some hesitated. Uh, but Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. So he's basically just reinstating what he said before to them, that he is the son of God. And he, now this is where our whole mission and ministry comes from as Christians. Okay, it can all kind of be summed up here in these last two lines. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, and of course we use that in baptism, right? That's what makes a baptism a baptism. You have to use the triune formula. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's not valid. Um, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Very important here. He doesn't say teach, obey them everything that God commanded them. He says teaching them everything that I commanded you. And what was Jesus' commandment? Love one another as I have loved you. Now, he says all the commandments are important, but remember, this is kind of the 11th commandment that we get from Jesus, that we love one another as Jesus loved us. So that's our command, to go baptize people, that is, bring them to the body of Christ, and to love one another as Jesus loved us. And I sometimes wonder if maybe we shouldn't flip those two around, because it's so much easier to bring people to the body of Jesus Christ when we've loved them, and when we do actively love them as Christ loved us. Because when we have that love, when we have that connection with them, it's so much easier for us to tell them about how Jesus has transformed our life and to invite them to come into the body of Christ if they're not Christian already. And so, um, but that's, that's what Matthew leaves us with. And then finally he says, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now. This is, of course, spelled out more in Luke when we have, you know, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming down. But it's kind of the same thing. Matthew's just kind of written this abbreviated version. Now, I will tell you this, too, just so you know, if you ever get into a theological discussion with people. Um, the original versions of Matthew's gospel, many people believe, ended with verse 15, where the gods go, guards go and talk and talk about what happened. This whole visitation with Jesus on the mountain, many believe was added later on to Matthew's gospel by one of his scribes who possibly heard the story 
or maybe heard the story in Luke's gospel, but it was incomplete, and added it to the gospel later. Now, does that mean that it's untrue or that it's false? No, it doesn't. Um, we all the time have people who write books, write addendums to those books, right? When things happen afterwards from when they wrote the book. And so, um, you know, maybe when Matthew was writing, he didn't have those stories in order. Or as he was transcribing, they got lost. Who knows? Uh, but somehow the story came back and we're so glad that it did because like I said, it really gives us our commission of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Um, one other thing that I think we sometimes get mixed up with is um, this on verse 19, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Now I wanna ask you, is that difference if he said go therefore and make all nations disciples? Does he ask us to go make every nation a Christian nation? Or does he go ask us to find Christians from every nation? That in every nation there will be those who believe in him and those who are called to him. And we see that happening particularly today. We have, you know, Christians in Africa, in Korea, in China, in the Middle East, in all nations. We don't make them Christian nations. That's not our call because that's an earthly thing. That's a power thing but we're all called to go find those disciples in every nation. We're supposed to fan, span the globe and everyone we come in contact to, wherever it is, we are supposed to call them to be disciples of Christ and invite them to the body of Christ through baptism, which is what Jesus commands us to do. So that is a really important chapter, regardless of how it ended up in Matthew's gospel, whether he wrote it at the time he wrote or whether it was added, from a story he told later, it really is an important, uh, an important gospel for us because that is what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. Um, you know, all the other stuff is nicety and icing on the cake, you know, the bells and smells and the morning prayers and the chanting and the monastic stuff and all that kind of stuff. Um, yes, that might be a way that we express our faith in Jesus Christ, but when it comes to doing Jesus' mission and ministry, this is it in a nutshell. Go out and love people, show them the love of Jesus Christ, and when they ask you how you come to that love, invite them into the body of Christ and invite them to be baptized. It doesn't matter what church it is, just into the body of Christ. And I, guess, I hope you guys all know as baptized members, of Jesus Christ, you have the right to baptize anybody. It doesn't have to, have to be a special Sunday service at the church. If you find someone on the side of the road who talks to you and they say, I really wish I could be baptized in the body of Christ. If you have water and know the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you can baptize that person into the body of Christ. Now, yes, we like them to come to church and we'd like to do a more formal baptism, but that one still counts. That one's still sufficient in the eyes of God and in the mind of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't say, go build a church and have a service on Sunday and make sure there are pretty flowers and loud music and bring them in and baptize them then. He said, go to the people, not bring the people to you. Go to the people. That's one of the things that we forget sometimes. We kind of got bogged down in the 40s and 50s and 60s in the church thinking church was all about our four walls, that church was insular and we could do everything we needed to do when we came to church on Sunday and then would leave and see church again next Sunday. <laughs> and we've come to realize, I think, that church is not just about our four walls. Jesus in this gospel calls us to go out. In fact, did Jesus ever build a church? No, for three years he wandered along the, 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 the countryside, right? With his disciples following him, going from place to place, from nation to nation, making disciples of all nations. In other words, Jesus is saying, go out and do what I did. Go out and do what you saw me do. Teach and preach and love. 
and bring those people into the body of Christ wherever you might find them. Isn't that simple? Nancy. Well, I just have a comment about that because um, in Kairos, going into the prison, and in Crisio, the big message is make a friend, be a friend, bring a friend to Christ. And right. if you live that every day, it doesn't matter where you are, mm -hmm. we bring him. And the other thing I want to comment on is huh? as soon as the nurse brought my newborns to me, I baptized them. There you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was Catholic then, but. Uh, yeah. Sorry. And Nancy's right. And that is very big in both of those movements. And notice the, notice the order of those for is though, first of all, be a friend. Make a friend. The first thing you have to do is be a friend yourself. Right. And then make a friend with somebody else and then bring that friend to Christ. Isn't it be a friend, make a friend, bring a friend to Christ? I think it's make a friend, be a Karen, what do you think? I think it's make a friend, be a friend. I'll oh. look it up. Is that that you had to be a friend in order to make a friend, right? How no, can you, you make a friend if you're not friendly with them? So, you, make, you make the new acquaintance, and then yeah. you, be, you, be, you, you are a friend with them. You make that by being a friend first. I always thought it was be a friend first, and then make a friendship with that person. And then through that friendship, when you tell them about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I think the difference is in that word is in the verbs where the verbs come. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, either I'll way, that we're, called, either way that we're called to go out, we're called to go out and bring the word to people, not wait for them to come into church and hope they come to see us. Our church is supposed to be active and out in the community. And yes, we come to church for us as the body to recharge and to to hug each other and to, to comfort each other and to be comforted by each other so that we can go on for the next six days of the week and go out and do Jesus' mission in the world. And then we come back on Sunday and do it again and we get fed by Jesus at the altar and we get fed by each other with the comfort that we share and the joy that we share. But our mission isn't sitting in the pew at St. Mary's. Our mission is in going out into Dade City and beyond and making disciples of Christ by loving them as Jesus told us to do. End of sermon. <laughs> um, any questions? We have about 10 minutes or so here. That concludes our study of Matthew. Um, and what a long book it was. We made it through it though, through the whole thing. And, um, and remember the main points of Matthew as we conclude this, that it was very important to him to link Jesus to the Old Testament so that there was a linkage between Jesus and the son of the family of David that was going to come and be the Messiah. He had to do that linkage so that the Jewish people that were following Jesus would know that it was something that had been prophesied, know that it was something that had been foretold in the Psalms and in the prophets. And so all throughout Matthew, we see that linkage You'll see all the time in Matthew, um, it'll be offset in quotes, Old Testament quotes that are in Matthew, Deuteronomy and things like that. And all of that is, the purpose of it is to link the life and mission of Jesus Christ to the Old Testament fulfillment of the prophecies. Okay? And um, as we read in chapter 25 two weeks ago, I, I truly believe um, that separation of the goats and lambs is, kind of the mini gospel in a nutshell to us, you know, um, when did you visit me? When did you bring me a drink of water? When did you feed me? When did you clothe me? Um, those things that you did for the least of mine, you did to me. And those things that you failed to do, you failed to do to me, not for me, to me. Because God and Jesus Christ are in each person. So when we fail to be Jesus Christ to that person, we are failing to do it to the Jesus Christ in that person, no matter who that person might be. And that's why we hesitate <laughs> when it says the disciples, but some of them hesitated. Sometimes we hesitate on that. Sometimes life, fear, whatever, whatever it is, causes us to hesitate to do that. But regardless, it is what we are called to do. Um, any thoughts on anybody? Um, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute un you and you can kind of say your piece. Anything 
not just these chapters, but as we've done this whole examination of Matthew, um, anything that stood out to you, anything that just um, maybe spoke to you in a new way? Any hands? Gosh, you guys are an easy crowd. No, no, no inquisitive hearts out there? Okay. I'll ask a question, then a loaded question, because it's on my heart a lot. How do you think we do as a church after we baptize people in really making active in them the commission of Jesus Christ? Keeping in mind that most of the people that we baptize are like between a baby and three years old, usually. Um, we don't really do all that much adult baptism anymore. But we baptize these people in the church and we have them do the renunciations and the promises to follow Jesus. But how much do we really follow up on that in the church these days as a church community? And should we do better? Yeah. I mean, it's obvious from Matthew's gospel that that's an important part of what we do, right? Baptism, bringing people to the body of Christ, giving them this commission, this message to go out and preach the gospel and bring people to Jesus. That's certainly our baptismal charge. Cheryl? Cheryl? You know, you're, um, we, we can't hear you very well. I don't know if it's your microphone or just the way you're. Huh? I can't hear you at all now, and you're real scratchy when you're talking. Um, are you using the microphone on your phone or? Hmm. Are we frozen up? No. Okay, can y'all hear me? Okay, because I can't hear anybody. Right? Well, I guess y'all are all muted, that's why. Um, yeah, Cheryl, I'm, I'm sorry, but um, all I was getting was a lot of crackling. I was getting a lot of static. I don't know, it could be your Wi-Fi connection too. It could be nothing wrong with your equipment, just the Wi-Fi. Um, do you want to type it out in the chat for us and we can read it on the screen? We all get the chat if you want to do that on the bottom of your thing. If you have a question or a statement, you can actually chat. Yeah. Um, that should go out to everybody. You can go in that Zoom chat group and chat while we're talking. If you have questions you want to throw at me or whatever, so I'll let you do that too. Nancy was getting some water aerobics in, I see. <laughs> Good girl. <laughs> um, well, while I'm waiting, if, if Cheryl's typing, it looks like she might be. Um, just real quickly, uh, keep in mind that next week we're going to be off because it's July 4th kind of week, so we're going to take a little break and kind of let Matthew settle with us, you know, let the silt settle. And then we'll come back the 9th. And on the 9th, for those who wish to, we're going to be meeting in person with social distancing and proper procedures, uh, mask if you have them, wear them, uh, in Freeman Hall, in the parish hall. We'll be far enough away that we can do that. If, however, you don't feel comfortable doing that, and I certainly understand why you wouldn't, I will have my computer there where I can Zoom the meeting, and I'll turn it around where you can see everybody that's there, and we'll have it turned up where we can still hear you. So. You'll still be able to participate just like you're sitting there, only it'll be a disembodied head doing your voice and stuff. So, um, But for those that want to get together and see each other in person, you're welcome to come to Freeman Hall. And if we don't have a lot of people doing that, then we'll come back to just doing the Zoom. But a few people last week kind of asked about when can we see each other. Um, so right. Will it be the same, um, the same Zoom address? Yes. Yes. Um, that Zoom invitation, the Zoom meeting number, is, is, is picked out expressly for the Christian education thing. So um, anytime we're going to do Christian education, you can use that meeting. 
that meeting number regardless of where it is. Okay. All righty. So um, anything else for the good of the order? Any other questions or comments about Matthew? Um, what I would like to do is I will send you guys out a reading list uh, for the New Testament for the ninth. We're going to start with Paul. And of course, the books in the Bible don't go by when he actually wrote them. They go by length. <laughs> so the longer writings are up front and then they go back to the lesser readings that are shorter, even though they're not, the, the New Testament is not in any chronological order whatsoever. Otherwise, all of Paul's letters would be before, Ma uh, actually Mark, and it would be Mark before Matthew instead of Matthew Mark, because Mark wrote first. So and that's what we're going to talk about in this whole thing. We're going to talk about the chronology of the New Testament. Rosemary. Um, I found uh, that um, movie. I couldn't get it on YouTube, but I found it on uh, Amazon Prime. Okay. Yeah, I, I have to wait until the first month because got to pay for the movie on Amazon Prime. Okay. But um, also, uh, I found a book on Amazon called Paul, uh, written by an Episcopal bishop. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was the imprimatur was um, 19, so it should be pretty current. Okay. Is that really good if any of y'all want to do some uh, reading up on that? You can also Google um, Paul's letters in the New Testament if you want to just get some background. And that'll also tell you a little bit about the order that they were written in. And um, remember, too, we kind of glaze over this when we do it Sunday. When we announce these, we say, the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Keep in mind, it's a letter. It's not a gospel. It's a letter that he's writing to the church in Corinth. So for the most part, they're about three or four pages. They're shorter um, books of the Bible than the gospels are because he's writing a letter. And generally when Paul writes a letter to the churches, he's writing for some particular purpose. In other words, he's heard from Timothy or Silas or one of the people that are at the churches that the church in Corinth is having an issue with this. And so he'll, he'll usually say that in his letter, I'll say, I've heard from Timothy that you were doing, you know, this, and then he'll go into his thing about uh, what his feeling is on, on those particular letters. Um, so, you know, when we do these, they're gonna be short. They're not gonna be big, huge honking chapters like we had in the gospels. And so what we'll probably do is we'll probably read maybe two or three letters a week and uh, go through those and, and really kind of really dive into them deeply. Um, it's unfortunate with Paul's letters that we tend to just pick verses out of there every now and then, you know, for things, Galatians 3.15 or, you know, whatever. We'll pick like a verse or two, and we really don't study Paul's letters in context with the entire letter. And that's kind of unfortunate because we really get a lot more out of them when we do that. Because Paul's a great setup man when he writes those letters to the church. He kind of first he sets up the he first sets up the problem that they're having. And then he kind of gives them what he thinks the solution to the problem is. And then he gives them the scriptural Jesus reference as to why he thinks that's the right way to do it. So there's a lot when we go through the letter all together, we see him tying in Jesus' teachings with what his opinion of, of the solution to the problem is. Um, we're also going to see as we go through Paul that as his letters age, his theology changes, um, particularly about resurrection and particularly about what happens to the body during resurrection and things like that. As time goes on and Jesus doesn't come back in, you know, 30 years time or whatever, and the time keeps marching on, Paul has to change because what happens is the early disciples start to die off. And so all the ones that Paul said, oh, yeah, Jesus is coming back next week. Well, 20 years later, some of them have died. And it's like, okay, they died before Jesus came back. We have to rethink how we do, you know, this, that, and the other. So um, Paul really was kind of a, an on-his-feet kind of theologian. Um, he really reacted to what was going on in the church and in the Christian faith. And so that's why I think his letters are so important, because we have some of those same questions. And I think as we look at Paul, and I'll reiterate this on the ninth, but remember that Paul is just like us. Paul was a sinner 
that had a come to Jesus moment, a transformation moment that turned his heart to Christ. So he is reading the Bible just like we do with hearts of flame in Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times that's why Paul's writings mean so much to us and are so relational to us because we find ourselves in the same position that Paul was in as people who were sinners and turned to Jesus Christ and now have a new heart in Christ. And so he sees things through those eyes. And a lot of times it can be miraculous for us to see those things anew again. And so March 9th, we'll start on Paul. We'll start reading the letters of the New Testament and really start seeing how the new church was developed. Okay? And um, I, I will tell you this. I'm not going to get tied into this because we usually do it with Luke and we read it a lot in church. But also in the week off, maybe read the book of Acts. Um, remember that Acts was written by Luke. And so even though they were written later, we're going to get to them later, but they might lay some groundwork for what happened with Paul just for y'all. Uh, you don't have to do a real deep dive. Just kind of read through them so you're familiar with what happened after Jesus ascended and the, the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost, kind of the first moves that were made in the new church because it really kind of sets the table for the letters that, that Paul's going to be writing and the later uh, later letters from James and Peter and, and stuff like that. So it just kind of gives you a, a bird's eye view of what's going to be going on with the New Testament. All righty. Well, um, I think we're at our time. We're just at 11 o'clock. So I, I think 1058, 1059, is that right? So unless there are any other questions, we get to leave school early today. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, recess. So um, I do thank you all for your time and attention. I'm so glad to have eight of us here today. Um, that's such a good thing. I know there's some folks out vacationing and so they weren't with us. So I'm hoping we have a little bigger group uh, on the ninth, but uh, please have a blessed next week and enjoy your time off. And I'll look forward to seeing you all on the ninth. And um, I will be communicating with Melinda to send stuff out to y'all uh, for the ninth, just so you know. And um, God bless you all. God bless. Okay. Bye-bye.